Good morning. Good morning, Val. Our first reading today is from Psalm 34, verses 1 to 8 and then 19 to 22. Of David, when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him away and he left. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called. The Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. And from 19, the righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from, all, from them all. He, he protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. And our second reading today comes from Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. Blind Bartimaeus receives his sight. Then he came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a, with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. One of the uh, characteristics of the ministry of Jesus was the great crowds that used to accompany him. And it was not uncommon, in fact, for anybody who was a bit of a teacher, had a new message or what have you, to attract a crowd in the days before iPods, iPhones, smartphones, notepads. Well, not notepads, but... In the days before media and TV and mass entertainment, people crowded to hear something new. These crowds would follow Jesus because not only did he have something new, not in that sense just bright and sparkly, but something that seemed to bring life. He taught as one having authority, unlike the scribes and the Pharisees. He was a breath of fresh air. Jesus and the disciples and a great crowd were passing through Jericho. They'd come across the plain to Jericho um, and they're on the way to Jerusalem. I'd suspect that in that crowd, the only person who knew what was happening in Jerusalem was Jesus. He knew that death and death on the cross awaited him there. But they are journeying. So Jericho is also known as the city of the palm trees due to a permanent spring and an oasis. And in a fairly arid country, that's a spectacular thing. You come through desert and you see lush green growth. I remember going to um, a village in uh, Rajasthan, it's a, a tribal village, uh, and a young man drove us out there in a jeep and I was sort of expecting an oasis, but in fact someone had drawn an X on the ground, they just built a village there because there was nothing, not a blade of grass, nothing. Very, very sandy area. But here Jericho, and Jericho had a very long history, but from the time of Joshua leading the nation into the promised land, the history was not quite as happy. 
at that time, of course, it was the, the, the entrance point. And so, you know, that they marched around the city and uh, on the seventh day they marched seven times, blew the trumpets, the wall fell down, and everybody was destroyed. Except for Rahab the prostitute and her family because she had hidden the spies. So God gave her, granted her, her life. More than life, she's in the genealogy of Jesus. So she had come in fully into the family of God by faith. Just to let you know, they're the worst sinner Christ died for. Not automatic. Repentance from dead works and faith towards God brings us into the kingdom. But there was an unhappy time. It was cursed by Joshua, in fact. In Joshua 6, the man who would rebuild it would lay its foundations with his firstborn. That is, the oldest child would die. When you do that, and he'll set up his gates, its gates rather, with his youngest child. And that curse was in fact fulfilled in the days of King Ahab. You can read that in 1 Kings 16. A man named Hiel built, uh, who came from Bethel, built Jericho. He laid its foundations with Abiram, his firstborn, and with his youngest, Segub, he set up its gates, according to the word of Joshua of Nun. So we need to be careful about those things and understanding back in those days how those things worked. It was destroyed again uh, at, at the time of the captivity and the people who lived there were taken to Babylon. And if you read through uh, in Ezra and Nehemiah, you'll see that I think there's some 370 of them, specifically from Jericho, returned with Ezra and Nehemiah to the land. Well, that's where they were in Jericho. Here, as they're coming into Jericho, they meet a beggar. We're going to India. No doubt we'll meet a beggar. There are millions of them. Uh, last time I was in Sydney on my own, I was waiting for a train at Central. I was hanging around for hours to catch that train. And on Central Railway, but out where the trams now run again, uh, I was just sitting down reading. And a man came up to me and shook me down for 20 bucks. There are beggars in Sydney now, homeless people. Um, Lloyd Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was begging by the roadside, and that's typically where they would be. They would be on a, well, there's a bit of a hierarchy. I suppose we should back up. You don't just go out and beg. It's not quite that you have to pay the council or get a certificate, but they do authorise people so that there were no bludgers and there were no thieves. Everybody knew who was disabled. Begging was a part of the provision for the disabled. And you think, well, that's a terrible thing. But in fact, if you hadn't allowed that, they wouldn't have eaten. So Bartimaeus was a beggar, uh, and he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was coming. So he obviously knew something about this great prophet or teacher or whatever he was. And as Jesus in the crowd, because he, he would have heard the, the, the noise, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many of them warned him to be quiet. Put a sock in it, Bartimaeus. Get back to what you're supposed to be doing and begging. Many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Can I ask you a question? What's the voice in your head that says, don't pray? Stop asking. You're wasting your time. You're wasting God's time. If indeed there is a God, he'll be far too busy running the universe to listen to you. You're worth nothing. What is that voice? I tell you what, it's not the Holy Spirit. It can be from straight from the pit of hell, it can often come through men and women of little faith. People of dead religion, no understanding of a lively faith in Christ and that fullness of the Holy Spirit that witnesses to the truth of Jesus Christ. Why would we not cry out to him? He alone can save. He is our healer. He is the one who fills us with the Holy Spirit and he's coming back again. Hallelujah. We need to be ready. Psalm 34, verse 4 said this, as in that reading this morning. He said, I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. 
So let, can I suggest that we need to ignore the doubters and pray all the more because God is listening to you, particularly when we come as Christians in the name of Jesus. Bartimaeus calls out son of David. That's a messianic term, which means that it was related to the Messiah that they were all waiting for. Not a surprise, really, but this blind man recognised that whoever that was with that big mob around him was the one. He calls out son of David. He said, I connect you with everything that we know about what God is doing. Son of David, have mercy on me. Only a Jewish person would say that. Only a Jewish person really had the right to say that because they were of that stream of faith at that time. And it's a fulfilment of that stream of faith. But it's an expression of faith. He isn't just said, oh, Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter, have mercy on me. He's spoken really uh, encapsulated God's history of salvation in that one title. And he was seeking mercy. He didn't presume anything. He didn't think, oh, I'm one of them, you need to give me the stuff. He's going, have mercy on me. I deserve nothing, but I'm looking for your grace. Jesus stood still. There's this whole crowd, there's this whole business that's going on. If you've seen crushes and crowds and what have you, and Jesus stopped just as he did when the woman touched the hem of his garment. Faith got his attention. Someone who really believed. Someone God had revealed something to this man who couldn't see across the road, but he could see Christ. Faith gets the attention of Jesus. And Jesus said, call him. And so they called the blind man. I love the way they put it. No, oh, mine's an old, uh, New King James. Be of good cheer. <laughs> Well, that's a great way to say it. <laughs> Get happy. Rise up. Stand up. He's calling you. And throwing aside his garment, Bartimaeus gets up. Now, it, that's an important thing. That coat, that cloak, was very important to Bartimaeus for a number of reasons. Because this was really a, a significant part of the way that he survived. A, he was wearing it. And it was, it was a, a type of cloak that was recognised by authority. It was a beggar's cloak. It was like the uniform in a sense. It wasn't quite that formal. But he had his beggar's cloak on. He threw that off. It gave the wearer some sort of legitimacy. And it qualified you to collect arms. When Bartimaeus discarded the coat, he was making a very bold declaration. He was saying he would no longer need this coat this cloak. Jesus had come and he was going to be healed. Listen, that's a step of faith. Threw that off. He would no longer be dependent on the government. He'd no longer be dependent on the help of another person. He'd be solely dependent upon the Lord. It's a big statement. We miss that sometimes. You sort of think we put our coat on and we come to Jesus. <laughs> We're hanging on to our wallet and we've got a hold of our diploma from wherever and, and all that stuff that we've got I'm ready, Jesus, to follow you. <laughs> and he hasn't called us. From this day forward, he began to experience the life of God in every aspect, in every aspect. So he allowed God to come in. There is something else about Bartimaeus' garment we need to notice. The coat is a picture of our coat, our comfort zones, and also of our sinfulness. Each one of us is clothed in that sinfulness until we are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And Bartimaeus was, in, his, in essence, putting off his old life and putting on the garment of Christ. In fact, Paul uses that expression, put on Christ. And it's exactly that. It's the same thing as taking up a robe and putting it on. Uh, in Isaiah, it speaks about the robe of righteousness. God clothes us with a robe of righteousness. And it's that righteousness of faith in Jesus Christ. Bartimaeus was tired of his old life. He was walking away from that life to forever. He recognised he couldn't have it both ways. Sometimes we think God's a bookmaker, I think. Are we going to put it on each way so we're going to win in a place, whichever way it goes? I don't know what that means, of course. <laughs> but it's like that. We do that. Uh, so... In case that doesn't work, I'll still be okay. 
But Bartimaeus is saying, I don't want that. No matter what happens, I want a new life. He could have stayed by the road for the rest of his life. It was a comfortable living. They, they did okay. It wasn't like they did that um, okay. He recognised, however, that living his life based on the circumstances of the day would mean that he would be locked into it forever. It's interesting, Simon and Andrew left their nets. James and John left their father's boat. Levi left his tax office. And Brian Bartimaeus left the beggar's coat behind. Again in Psalm 34, verse 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the person who trusts in him. I had ice cream yesterday. That mightn't be much to many of you. But for a man in humble circumstances, married to my wife. And you had it the night before. And I had it the night before as well. So we had... Sorry? Uh, vanilla. <laughs> but that was fine. It was garnished with really nice homemade. And the chocolate sauce one. Oh, that was yesterday. Oh, goodness. I got a McDonald's thing yesterday. <laughs> I've been a really good boy this weekend. However, tasting and seeing that the Lord is good is a different realm altogether. It's, it's not that physical taste. And when we've had the encounter with Jesus, it's very real. And it impacts our lives. And he calls us to throw off that cloak and to follow him. Blessed is the person who trusts in him. And David had that revelation as he's speaking those things. He's telling us to taste and see because you'll discover that God is good. So Jesus is talking to a blind man who's got up after crying out to him. They finally shut him up. And he said, what do you want? Well, duh. What's the obvious answer to that? Well, in fact, it's not that obvious. I sat and thought about it. This man sat by the roadside and asked people for money. Who would know how many years he had been doing that? And Jesus is going, well, what do you want from me? And I was thinking about um, that question. I'm thinking about the ad that's on telly at the moment. It's called the Priceless Eyes Project. And I think it's Specsavers that run it. But they've, they set up a... Uh, um, a fake uh, questionnaire uh, through a fake research company just to, to see, to gauge people's response. And they say, well, how much would you give for your eyes? We'll, we'll give you six, one of them, we'll give you six million dollars. And they're going, I don't, no, there's no way in the world. I've got a family, I've got responsibilities. And anyway, nobody wants to not see. Nobody ever wants that. What do you want me to do for you? What did he want more than money? Oh, interesting. He said Rabboni, which is a very respectful title. It means master rather than just teacher. There are plenty of teachers, one master. So he's acknowledging that. A teacher with authority, perhaps. But he said, that I may see. And those people on the television ad understood that eyesight the most precious thing. Whether you put 50 cents in the cup or 50 bucks was never going to change his life. He'd still be a blind beggar tomorrow. But he had stood up and called to Christ for a very good reason. He didn't want to be a blind beggar. Jesus replied, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus. Did you see what happened there? Go your way, and he followed Jesus. <laughs> his way had become following Christ. His way was no longer sitting, sitting in the dust, hoping for something good to happen today. The lottery of life will pass him by. Maybe that 50 cents will be 50 bucks today, and I'll be right for a week or whatever. But when Jesus said, go your way, Bartimaeus is going, my way is your way. And so he's a man who stood up without that beggar's cloak. He stood up without that blindness. And he's begun to follow someone he's never seen before, but whom he did see before he received his eyesight. You know, most of the things that 
God wants us to do as followers of Christ happen while we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. How many of us are waiting for a call? You know that today is the day. Today is the day. And we need to be listening for the coming of Jesus. He passes by and he goes around, he passes by regularly. We need to be listening. We sang something of um, that this morning. Master, speak. I'm listening. That's important. That was Samuel. That was a little kid. That song is based on. Speak, Lord. Your servant heareth. Are we, are we listening? Do we care about that stuff? Do we ever turn the media down off and start to focus on God and say, well, what would you say to me? Do we understand really that so much of our lives, and I don't mean to patronise people or to be rude, but so much of our lives ends up not much better than begging, hoping that we'll get enough from our super or we'll get enough from the government or from the sale of our assets and our house and, and that'll take care of me. And they're good things. They're not sinful things. That's not growing dope out the back of whoop whoop. That they're, they're normal things we do in Australia. And so I'm not saying they're wrong. But is your faith in that? My goal is to be happy till I die. Good luck with that. Um, that's not the goal of Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus was probably quite content in many ways. But there was more. And that more would come through Jesus. And as he stood, as he got rid of the old, Jesus gave him something precious and new. Gave him not only sight to go and enjoy because he'd also now have to get a job so to speak but he followed Christ he gave him a journey and a direction and he gave him purpose in life and that's a purpose that's never fulfilled any other way Jesus elsewhere said to the Pharisees there are none so blind as those who will not see as those who choose not to see for those whose, whose seeing is introspective, whose seeing is limited really by other factors. But he wants us to be expanded. And for that we need to drop that cloak. Whatever that is that's holding you back, that stops you from living a life of faith. And I don't mean claiming a Mercedes Benz by faith. I'm talking about following Jesus. I'm talking about sharing that faith that you've got with the world. You will go to places I'll never go to. And I'll go to places you'll never go to. My job, my mission, sure I choose to accept it as one who once was so blind and now sees, is to hear and obey. Not to hear and change the channel or see what's on... Those, those things are all okay. Don't let them be your focus. There are good things for you to do. I... Twice, I think, in my time here, I've handed out those little bookmarks. Well, those, there are those who don't need those because they don't pray. And there are those who don't need those because they pray another way. That's fine. I'm not here to say thou shalt use the bookmark. If you're not praying for people in our community, you need to speak to Jesus about that, uh, not to me. But when your eyes are open and you understand the enormity we spoke about extolling the Lord in verse 1 this morning. Let us extol the Lord together. It's not a religious thing. Let's gather in a funny little building that's freshly painted, that's heritage listed, and extol the Lord. Well, that's a good thing. I'm glad we're here to do it. But that's not what he's talking about. We need to be extolling the Lord in all that we do. McLean needs to know that Christ died for their sins that the crowd that surrounds Jesus is already here. And we need to be making that noise so the blind will hear the good news. Now I understand there's different theologies. If God wants to save the lost, he'll do so without the likes of you. I've never read where it says that in here. And I rebuke that theology because many people have been left for the roadside simply because there's some sort of predeterministic way of looking at things. Christ told us to go into the world. 
and we will meet plenty of Bartimaeuses. And their disability will always be that they don't know Christ yet. And their ability will then become, possibly, the same ability and the only decent ability that you and I have. And that is that we know Christ and his spirit dwells in our hearts. If that's not the case, you need to go back and get rid of that cloak and come to Christ afresh. Because he loves you. The gospel is good news. The gospel is powerful news. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God under salvation for the Jew first, for this old covenant people and for anybody else. That includes us in Australia. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, that you have lifted the scales from our eyes. That indeed, Father, once we were blind, but now we see. That, Lord, help us this morning, Lord, to expand, Lord God, as Isaiah says, to stretch forth the tent pegs of our habitation, that, Lord, we begin to see a greater panorama of the things that you have for us that, Lord, your purpose for our lives would expand before us, would come into, uh, into high definition, Lord God, that we would see clearly what you would have us do. That, Father, we would not be hindered by the usual things where we think, well, we're too old or we're, uh, this, we have issues and problems, we don't have money, we don't travel, we don't have a licence, whatever that is. But, Lord, you would show us what you would have us do where we are in the situation where we are today. That, Lord, indeed, you might even empower us to rise above things and to do exceeding abundantly above and beyond all that we could ask or desire because you're at work in us. But, Father, this morning we thank you. You've left nothing to chance, but you've sent Jesus. And we receive afresh his presence today. Help us, Lord, to cast off the beggar's cloak. No longer beggars, but kings and priests unto our God as we come in Jesus' name. Amen.